What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And on this Thursday, in the first week of Lent, we continue our devotion through the Gospel of Mark and the faith of our fathers. Stick around. <music> been working through the Gospel of Mark, and for this first week of Lent, uh, we've also been adding a little bit of catechesis, and we're going to do that again today. So we're reading through the Gospel of Mark. We've got another great quote from Martin Luther, and of course, we'll meditate on some more of the commandments. So let's, let's get started. We're in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, starting at verse 21. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket, or under a bed, and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts it to the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which... When sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples. He explained everything. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you so little faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Another telling of the parable of the sower I suppose uh, it's good to know that uh, <laughs> um, that the, the growing of the seed is not our responsibility, that God grows the seed. He grows it in us, and he grows it uh, in the world that uh, is not ready to hear it, doesn't he? So this, again, this word uh, for everyone, and the kingdom of God being like a mustard seed, I think in mainland American Protestantism, especially amongst televangelists, it's health, it's wealth, it's prosperity, it's living a glorious life now. No. The kingdom of God is likened to the most tiny and obscure thing. But it grows, and it becomes a great, great tree. The kingdom of God is simple. It is humble. And God grows it to his will. And that's good news. Now, let's get to our writing from Martin Luther as we continue to look back on the history of our faith and learn it from that faithful cloud of witnesses that has gone before us. But there follows that promise which should be written in gold letters and should be extolled in the languages of all people, for it offers eternal treasures for it cannot be understood in a material sense, namely, that it would be confined to this people only, as the previous blessings were. But if, as the words clearly indicate, this promise is to be extended to all nations or families of the earth, who else, shall we say, has dispensed this blessing among all nations except the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ? 
the statement of the text, all families of the earth, is now to be understood of extent only, of the families of one time, but of duration, as long as the world will stand. This blessing will endure until the end of the world, since the gates of hell, Matthew 16, 18, tyrants and ungodly men will oppose it and rage against it in vain. Therefore, it is proper for us to contrast the blessing of this passage with the curse under which all human beings are because of sin. The curse has been taken away by Christ, and a blessing will be bestowed to all who receive him and believe in his name. The remarkable blessing is this, that after being freed from sin, from death, and from the tyranny of the devil, we are in the company of angels and God and have become partakers of eternal life. In these few simple words, the Holy Spirit has thus encompassed the mystery of the incarnation of the Son of God. The holy patriarchs and prophets explained this more fully later on in their sermons, namely, that through the Son of God the entire world would be made free. Hell and death would be destroyed. The law would be abrogated. Sins would be forgiven. And eternal salvation and life would be given freely to those who believe him. Uh, during our Lenten devotion, we're continuing on focusing on repentance uh, and the joy that comes from the absolution. So we go on uh, to the fifth and sixth commandments for our Lenten catechesis. The fifth commandment, you shall not murder. The entire sum of what it means not to murder is to be impressed most clearly upon the simple-minded, Deuteronomy 6-7. In the first place, we must harm no one either with our hand or by deed. We must not use our tongue to instigate or counsel harm. We must neither use nor agree to use any means or methods by which another person may be injured. Finally, the heart must, be, must not be ill-disposed towards anyone or wish another person ill in anger and hatred. Then body and soul may be innocent towards everyone, but especially towards those who wish you evil or inflict such things upon you. It is God's ultimate purpose that we let harm come to no one, but show him all good and love. He would ever remind us to reflect upon the first commandment, He is our God, which means he will help, assist, and protect us in order that he may quench the desire of revenge in us. The sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery. The last five commandments begin by take, talking about our neighbor personally. Then they proceed to talk about the person nearest him or the closest person next after his body, namely his wife. So she is one flesh and blood with him, Genesis 2, 23 through 24, so that we cannot inflict a higher injury upon him in any good that is his. Therefore, it is clearly forbidden here to bring any disgrace upon our neighbor regarding his wife. Among us, there is such a shameful mess and the very dregs of all vice and lewdness. The sixth commandment is directed against all kinds of unchastity, whatever it may be called. Not only is the outward act of adultery forbidden, but also every kind of cause, motive, and means of adultery. Then the heart, the lips, and the whole body may be chased and offer no opportunity, help, or persuasion towards inchastity. Not only this, but we must also resist temptation, offer protection and rescue, honor, wherever there is danger and need. To speak in the briefest way, everyone must live chastely himself and help his neighbor to do the same. Again, a hard commandment to bear in our culture, which says if it feels good, do it. Adultery is not just intercourse with someone to whom you're not married, or, or intercourse outside of marriage. Um, it's to be understood that adultery is in the heart, and adultery is uh, indecent and lewd thoughts about another person. Um, and adultery, you see, God creates, I said this in the last one, God creates good things. And so God has instituted marriage, one man and one woman, his institution. And the devil cannot destroy that institution, but he can corrupt it. And he corrupts it with adultery. So intercourse uh, or impure thoughts of a sexual nature towards anyone or with anyone to whom we are not married, according to God's institution, is sin. And forbidden by the commandment, you shall not commit adultery and murder, the fifth commandment. Well, I've never murdered anyone. 
I served uh, two tours in Iraq. I've only ever pointed a 50 cal at someone with the intent to shoot. Now, that uh, is not murder. That is, uh, as Paul would say, the government having the right to bear the sword. But thank God I did not have to <laughs> suppress that trigger. Um, but So a lot of us can say, well, I haven't murdered anyone. Okay. Have you thought evil of them? Have you thought about what it would be like to murder them in your head? Well, then repent. So as we continue through these commandments during this penitential time of the season of Lent, we reflect on their goodness and on God's mercy because we can clearly see that we do not keep them. But thanks be to God that we have this season of fasting and repentance to reflect on this and to realize again and again, as we need to be told every day, Jesus was crucified and raised for your forgiveness, we pray. Blessed Lord, since you have caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning, grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you and the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.